thank you, Damien, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to the Buenos Aires Logic Group to uh, talk here at the Logic Supergroup, although I'm not a logician in the strict sense of the, the word, but I'm a philosopher of uh, formal sciences, logic, mathematics, and contentiously computer science. And my current research, so I am from Brazil, but I am re uh, currently in Paris until next Friday for my sabbatical. And what I am presenting to you today is um, it's a sort of a narrative of how my uh, research changed during this sabbatical here. So I'm going to tell you my motivations for the research that I came here to do and the motivations for changing the perspectives from the methodological point of view, although the theme and the problem is, um, or the, the, the main problem of the research is still the same. So here's what I promise you uh, with the abstract. Um, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you now that I'm just that I'm, I've been working with the case now, uh, with the uh, four color theorem proof as a study case since my PhD that I've completed in Rio in 2013, 13. Uh, under the supervision of Luis Carlos Pereira. And uh, what I've been doing since then, as much as it is possible with the workload that we have in Brazil as professors in public universities, uh, it's, uh, I've been working on the reconstruction and the revision of the philosophical debates surrounding this famous mathematical result. Um, and so this is what I did in the in the thesis in the in the dissertation, right? Uh, this this revision from a Wittgensteinian perspective, uh, so to speak. And the reason why I think it is just in, just to to give you a, a, this this context, right, of, of of what I am communicating to you today, um, from this this Wittgensteinian perspective that I've developed in the PhD dissertation, uh, it's it, it's justified because Wittgenstein was in a certain moment of the, the, the debate surrounding the four color theorem group, Wittgenstein was, especially by this um, uh, British philosopher Stuart Schenker, his, some of his insights into philosophy of mathematics were integrated into the debate uh, in a very curious position defended by Schenker, which was the position according to which the four color theorem uh, proof is not a proof, it's an experiment. And he said that based on supposedly Wittgensteinian ideas, right? So uh, these ideas, this particular idea of Schenker was after, uh, afterwards criticized by Shelley Stewell, which was a student, uh, a student of him. And then uh, Luis Carlos and I, we wrote a paper in 2017 in which we reconstruct this uh, introduction of Wittgenstein into the debate, and then we developed it a little bit. What we did was to discuss some criteria that Shelley Stewell uh, proposed to, to revise uh, Schenker's idea, because what he said was literally, for Wittgenstein, this would not be a proof. It would be an experiment, right? And this distinction between uh, mathematical proofs and um, experiments in, in um, natural sciences this distinction is key uh, for Wittgenstein, not only in the philosophy of mathematics of his late period, middle period and, and late period, but also from the Tractatus on. There is an aphorism in the Tractatus where he says explicitly, calculation is not an experiment. So this dichotomy between proof and experiment, um, it's, it's something that you can see throughout the development of his thinking. And, and it is one of the main keys for distinguishing uh, for for uh, talking about uh, surveyability of proofs, which is another Wittgensteinian theme in philosophy of mathematics. But the point for me was always that when using Wittgenstein to say that this is not a proof, even though the mathematical community accepts it, accepts it as a proof, this sounds very not Wittgensteinian. So that was my main motivation to, for one, you know, for one side to look better, to investigate better what were Wittgenstein's idea on this distinction and for other ones to apply his ideas to try to dissolve some problems that I saw in all this philosophical uh, debate surrounding the group. This is what I did. I'm not talking about Wittgenstein today, right? Because after so many years thinking of uh, 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 dedicating myself to 
see this philosophical debate and try to dissolve in a very in a way some problems in it. Uh, I started to think about other problems and what I am going to do today is to talk about this specific one problem, which is the problem about the identity of different versions of the same proof, in particular the proof of the four color theory proof. So in the first uh, section I will tell you a little bit about the proof so we can uh, know at least a little bit uh, concepts that are involved in it and the main strategies for the proof. Uh, then I will talk about briefly about the, the controversial reactions within the mathematical community and amongst philosophers, just to also, again, so we can know where are we about here. And then the new question, which is the question about the identity of the three versions of the proof and how I am tackling the problem now. Because one year, as you will see, it's really, and in fact, it wasn't one year, it was like half in the middle of this pandemic that I've changed my perspective. So it's really work in progress here. So we, uh, by the end, I will tell you how I am continue to tackle the problem of the identity of proofs uh, from this uh, new perspective that I am uh, presenting to you today. But before uh, we start, let me tell you, um, as it happens with many other mathematical proofs, uh, in the history of mathematics, the history of the four color theorem proof is long and complex. Between the first formulation of the problem, very intuitive formulation that uh, Francis Guthrie communicated to Augustus de Morgan through a, a letter, um, between uh, 1852 and 1977, when the proof was finally presented, a long his, uh, mathematical history <laughs> developed and uh, many advancements in mathematics were developed because of the four color theory proof, especially uh, in topological graph theory, right? So graph theory, topology, combinatorics too. These are areas of mathematics that again, as in many other cases, like if we think about the, uh, Andrew Weil's proof of the Fermat, Fermat's left theorem, it's the same thing, right? You connect various and different areas of mathematics. So this is not difference, different with the case of a before color theorem proof. But also what you, one, one aspect which is interesting in this history is that the history of computer science is always involved in it, is also involved in it. So it's not only a, a mathematical history, it's also a history that involves the development of um, the computer science, right? And so it's very, very complex. And here, I, I like, I always like to show this map here. It's a diagram that is in Saatchi and Kanan's book uh, about the four color theorem, uh, which is called Assaults and Conquests. <laughs> uh, and, and they present this, this diagram as a way to show a little bit, they call this the logical organization of their book. Uh, and then say, look, here are some parts of mathematics involved in the solution of the problem, right? And they say, well, it's not possible to make a, a, a very faithful map of everything, because then we will be talking about the entire history of graph theory, topology, and stuff, right? So just to give an uh, just, uh, illustration of the complexity. So I'm really just focusing on um, the, the main concepts and strategies of the proof so we have we can have an idea. So the problem is a very simple one. Even a child can understand. Uh, do only four colors suffice to color any map in such a way that no region sharing a border is colored with the same color? Uh, the, the problem uh, uh, articulates two demands. So one is the demand for for colorability, and the other one, the demand that we call the admissible coloring, which is this idea that uh, no, we, you, you cannot have uh, neighbor uh, regions sharing the same color, right? which is intuitive because if you are, if you want to differentiate regions in the map, of course they cannot have the same color. Uh, by its turn, this second demand uh, articulated in the problem. Uh, makes us to define what is to be a neighborhood adjacent, uh, adjacency um, adjacent region, right? And one important thing that already De Morgan noticed 
by the time that the problem was being communicated to the mathematical community is that to share a border is to share a border line and not a point. Because if you share a point, either you lose for colorability or you lose admissibility of the coloring, right? Like in this example here, they're both counter examples to this, um, to the fact that you cannot have uh, a point as sharing order. Uh, and also another important thing regarding the formulation of the problem is that we are only talking about uh, maps in the plane or planner maps, not maps in the sphere. We are in fact not talking about real maps. We are talking about planner normal maps. And normal maps are maps that uh, they satisfy some, some conditions like this, the three main ones are this. Uh, in a normal map, you don't have one region separated into uh, in two regions. Like for example, in Brazil, Fernando de Noronha is part of the state of Paraíba, right? Or you cannot, so this is Fernando de Noronha. <laughs> so you cannot have um, a map in which one region is completely surrounded by other regions or one other region, like, like it was uh, just one region here and then a sort of donut around it. You cannot have this configuration. And also you cannot have, like you have in the map of the United States, uh, a configuration with four regions touching together, like Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and Mexico, four regions sharing a single point, okay? So in normal maps, you will not have this kind of configuration. And also, so the map of the United States is not normal because of the third condition, but also because Michigan is split into, into regions. Right. Uh, so we're talking about normal planner maps and by their turn, normal planner maps, maps in general can be translated into graphs, right? So we consider each region as having a sort of capital and then we, uh, we draw uh, edges between them and then we have a graph, right? Because we are talking about normal planner maps we are talking about normal graphs too, so they are connected. All, all, all these graphs are directly connected because of this condition. So all these conditions will be translated into the, the, graph, form, the, the graph theory formulation of it. So again, maps are represented as undirected, uh, undirected graphs because there, there's no direction. You, know? you don't need to think about the sense of the, um, the um, vertices. And so here we have the map of India, right? Transformed into um, a graph. And what happens is that when we construct the dual of a map, which is the graph, graphs can be by their turn translated into poly poly polyedra, right? So for example, this configuration here, we will have a graph that corresponds to the tetraedron. And this is important because then in the solution of the problem, we can apply Euler's Poiliedra formula, formula to, uh, to the solution of the problem, right? This will appear later again, this, this aspect here. So yeah, here's Euler's Poiliedra formula. We, um, what we have is from the very common uh, formulation that even a child can understand, we have a topological version of the problem and then a graph theoretical version of it. In fact, you can resolve whatever you, know, you want to, okay? Um, so this for the main concepts, so to speak, and now the general strategy of the group. I am talking, of, I, I will present here the strategy of the first tentative proof, which was offered by uh, Alfred Bray Camp in 1879. Then 11 years later, <laughs> someone saw, Percy Helwood saw a problem in it, uh, in the proof of, uh, in one of the lemmas of the, um, the proof. But even the real proof, like the proof that was presented by Apple and Haken in 77, 1977, preserves the same strategy. So since it's simpler to understand the first version, here we go. Uh, it is um, it is a proof by uh, reduction, reduction ad absurdum, right? Which contains a proof by cases. So we want to prove that for every normal map there is an admissible four coloring. Then the hypothesis negating this um, 
the, what we want to prove says that there is at least one five chromatic normal map, which is also the smaller one. This is important for the strategy of the proof, right? This is still the, still the case. So the hypothesis said that negates the, the, the possibility, the admissibility of four colorings. And no, there is at least one which is five color, and it is the smallest possible map. So what the camp's idea was first, so the proof is, is uh, split in two parts. First, to prove that uh, every map no matter, no matter what map, every map contain at, contains at least one region with five or less adjacent regions, and this was correctly proved. And from the construction, then he, he constructed this set here, and then what he made was to, the, the idea was to, now I'm going to prove that each one of these regions is reducible. Because if I can prove that each one of these regions, that at least one of them must occur in any map, that they are reducible, then I find the contradiction with the idea that there is at least one, which is five chromatic and is the smaller one. Right? So it's, it's not that complicated, right? <laughs> I show that every map must contain at least one of these four, and then I show step by step. Here is the inductive uh, step of the proof. Uh, case by case, I show that they are reducible. And he proved it, the reducibility of configurations of type A, B, and C. But in the proof of lemma four, that no normal, no minimal normal five chromatic map has a region with five adjacent regions, there was a flaw. And the problem is with, uh, it, <laughs> It's not, it's not surprising that there was a flaw because the method to find, the method to show the reducibility of regions bigger than three are complicated. It's a sort of, he, it's, nowadays it's called camp chains. So you need to make a lot of, if you think in terms of graphs, you need to find paths of colors and then you need to change this, the colors in this path and so on. And uh, in lemma three, it's, is relatively easy to understand, but in the case of lemma four, you need to make these changes of colors in the in the chains in two simul simultaneously in two changes, in two uh, chains. So it's really complicated, and they didn't have computers, right, to verify things by the, <laughs> for them. So it was really tricky. So the error was in the um, proof of lemma four, right? Uh, yeah, and then of course you have the formulation in terms of graphs. Okay, it's just uh, just uh, to remind you that. Well, then what? Right? Then, as I said, from 1780-79 to uh, seven, 977, all that complex history uh, uh, developed, and it's very interesting because in the papers presenting the proof, it's a two-part paper. Um, Apple and and Haken they say. The first uh, se section of the proof is a historical approach. They tell the main, the main, uh, the main results that were produced in this um, 125 years, right? So this is a quote of the paper. They say many attempts since that, since the flaw in this allegedly proof of of uh, Kempe was found. Nah? many attempts have been made to find the proof. And they distinguished, they made a typology of attempts to repair the flaw in Kemp's work and to find the new and different approaches of the problem. Amongst the, the type, the first type, they distinguished two subtypes. Um, attempts to find an essentially stronger chain argument. Chain argument is the name of the argument that I was just telling you about, which is, but you change the colors of the path surrounding a configuration. Uh, proving that a minimal counterexample cannot uh, contain any pentagon, or the second attempt to make a more extended use. So basically, they didn't change the strategy. They just saw that things were more combinatorially more complicated than that. They, not people before them, saw it. So the idea was just was not to change the strategy, but just to make a broader application of the same strategy for uh, find, for reducing uh, the, these configurations. 
So this is the um, way that they applied the method that they uh, developed. And then uh, again, just to, this is, I think it is important historically, just for, for in terms of uh, historical justice, to uh, uh, mention these two persons here, uh, George Berghoff and Heinrich Hasch, uh, which was a German mathematician who was key to the development of the proof of Apple and Hackett's proof. They've collaborated uh, for many, many years. Hash was uh, the one responsible for developing the method through which uh, the, the proof was uh, found. And um, he, he didn't have a position in Germany as a professor. He worked in uh, uh, electrical engineering, engineering, uh, uh, like in the, you know, he was an independent from the academia. He was able, this is amazing, he was able to identify just looking at it if a configuration was reducible or not. So he was so, he worked so many years with these graphs and with these diagrams that he was able to identify in the look. Um, and another thing is that the first time when where uh, computers were used to try to tackle the problem were, was in Germany. And so it was uh, Carl Dure was uh, the name of the person who developed a program in uh, Algol 16, which is a high level, uh, uh, high level programming language. But computers in Germany didn't have enough power to run the program, memory enough. So when Hash came to the United States to work with uh, Haken, uh, they tried to tackle the problem many, many times. And then one student of Haken was able to develop, he made another program in uh, assembler language, which is a low level uh, uh, programming language. And then computers, they were able to, to deal, they have memory enough to deal with this. Of course, it was inelegant, mathematically inelegant, but, and, and it's interesting, you know, I've been reading a lot of sociology and history of the proof. And something tells me that they split ways when they decided to go for the low level language stuff. And then Hash will say, oh, no, this is just brute force. I don't like it. And so it's just, I should be able to interview them, like personally to say, hey, did you fight guy? OK, but uh, this is just uh, gossip. OK, so I think it's important to say that in German, they were about to prove the four color theory proof, but their machines were not powerful enough and they didn't want to pay the price of inelegancy of the programs. Right. Uh, so computers entered into the scene because the, of course, the set, the unavoidable set of configurations to be reduced, uh, it was not, it, it's not, um, they're not that simple. You have other more complex configurations. So for example, Berghoff in the beginning of the 20th century, he improved the techniques that were used by Kemp in the first tentative proof. And he made a classification of the, the, the types of complexity that you have in, in the, in the uh, configurations of the reducible, the unavoidable set, right? So he made, uh, he developed a measure for this complexity and uh, divided uh, kinds of reducibility, reducibility. So you have A, B, C, and D reducibility techniques. So it's a lot of uh, technical uh, combinatorial work. And then, as I said, Hash uh, worked for many, many years uh, in the in the um, in this part of the proof, which is the construction of the unavoidable set. And uh, he made an analogy between. This is key. He made an analogy between graphs and uh, electrical networks. So his, his method to produce, to produce the um, unavoidable set of configurations or to prove the reducibility of these configurations was to consider that a graph, of course we know that graphs have a, we say a degree, uh, which is the amount of edges that meet at one vertex, right? And then he thought that if we consider that this is like an electrical network and we think that the entire network must have a positive charge, even if we, if, when we transport charges from one vertex to another, 
uh, then you can apply again, you can apply a, a more complex formulation of Euler's formula. And then you can, uh, the, what he said was uh, the, the method that he developed was his discharging procedure, right? So you can imagine that you have charges going through the graph, right? And this is the method through which you prove the reducibility of the, so here we have a quote. Since the network must have an overall positive charge, at least one member of the least of the unavoidable set must appear in any graph corresponding to a minimal five chromatic normal map. And then you have the list that you want. So again, the idea is uh, to move positive charge through the net, the graph, and uh, not entering into many details. The thing is that this method is so potentially algorithm that you can implement into computers. That's the thing, right? The method for this discharging procedure, it's a lot of combina combinatorics going on and then you can uh, make a, a program. And then uh, computers really enter the scene and this is one of the papers uh, that Apple and Haken wrote to publicize the result. There is a lot. The sociology of mathematics, Donald McKenzie, he talks about the storm of publicity. They even have a stamp for color supplies. It was all over the place. It was in the New York Times, it wasn't the science, it was every, every news, even newspapers uh, were talking about it when they proved it. So this is just a quote to say that um, it was because of the advent of high speed, uh, speed digital computers that they were able to, to tackle the problems. Uh, oh, here is the stamp, just to say that I'm not lying <laughs> them for color supplies. Illinois. And then, uh, okay, so the uses of computer, right? Uh, where the computers um, participated uh, into the proof. Uh, not only in this part that I was telling you about, which is the uh, construction of the unavoidable set of configurations, but in the, um, so in fact, the construction of the unavoidable set of configuration was just an heuristic use as they, Hash started making it by hand, okay? Then they used computer for some time, but then it was so complex to implement the program that in the end they thought it was easier to make it, to do it by hand. Then so they let the computer was used for some time and then later abandoned. But, so here's the key, it's between steps four and six uh, that the uh, computer was really used. And why is this important is that because because of the particular use that they made, which means they construct an unavoidable set. Okay, let's see if this set can be reduced. Then they tested it with an algorithm. So if the, the set was not reducible, then they just came back and rewrote the program again. So to try again. So this is the, and they talk in this vocabulary of text, test, and experimenting and stuff. So this is one of the reasons why later math, some mathematicians, but also philosophers were saying, oh, you see, this is not mathematics. This is experimental science because they were testing it, right? It's a kind of ad hoc uh, program that were being used here and it was being constructed at the same time that the problem was being resolved, okay? So I think it is important to, to talk about that. So, okay, and then, and then the proof was, um, as I said, presented in two um, papers that correspond directly to the structure of the proof. One is you use the discharging procedure to construct the unavoidable set. And the second, you prove that each configuration of the set is reducible, right? In the end, you have sort of a 600 pages that I've printed here. So you have, of course, I, uh, I just did like four pages in one because if not, it would be something like this, right? But then look, you have millions of diagrams, 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 that in a notation that was specially done for this aim, for this proof here, right? So I uh, will explore this idea later. Um, 
which is this, not only the program was ad hoc, specially constructed for this aim, but also the notation from the diagrammatic part of you, right, it was specially developed for this, uh, for this program. So we have here this famous, almost uh, famous uh, quotation, quote in which they uh, talk about this, the fact that was responsible for all the fuss around the proof, which is that certain facts were uh, verified by the use of 1200 hours of computer time, which is also interesting sociologically because they needed, like they were exploring their political relations within the university so they could use the computers during the night because there was only like two computers in the university. <laughs> okay, so very, I will, it's, this will be very sketchy is just about the first reactions to the proof from within the mathematical community, accusations, so to speak. So it wasn't well received at first because, come on, computers. So one of the things was not directly related, related with the use of computers, but the fact that it, it's, a, it's a proof without a good structure. You don't see why. You have a lot of calculations and then you don't see exactly why the theorem is, is uh, true, right? And of course, because of because you are using computers and not everyone knows how computers work, so maybe you have hidden errors, right? From the point of view of the computer science, programs, because the programs would, were not formally verified and they were this sort of ad hoc stuff, the algorithms, and written in low level programming language that were mere brute force, not elegant, again, people were not satisfied. The authors, nevertheless, said that, you see, this complexity, this algorithmic complexity of the proof is typical for proofs in graph theory, at least by the time, right? So it's not because it's not because it is a proof by exhaustion, by, by cases that uh, you, you don't like this proof, because if you don't like this one, then you don't like a lot of other proofs in, in graph theory, right? And from the point of view of the merely inductive uh, verification of the programs, what they say is that it's enough. For us, it is enough. We don't need a formal verification of our program because it's so simple from the computational point of view that if you want, you can program you know, your computer to do it and then you can verify it by hand. The important thing is that you put inputs right. And then they, then you have more chances of committing, of uh, making errors, right? So, oh, well, this is just a quotation to see how proofs go in graph theory from this paper by Swart, okay? So it's uh, the, the proof by cases are very common in, um, in graph theory. The thing is that sometimes this, the cases are, you know, two or three or four, and sometimes they are nearly, as in the case. Uh, regarding the possibility of errors, too, this is just another quote to give uh, uh, to substantiate this uh, response that they have, saying, uh, "Look, when we have proofs very mathematically very complex, like Andrew Lyle's proof of Fermat's theorem, one error can destroy everything. But our thing is really simple." You know, a hidden error in these calculations would not destruct the structure of the proof because the structure is this. It's a reduction absurdum with the proof by cases. So it's not, not the same kind of error. And uh, here, because of the, I like this response that they gave to the problem uh, regarding the possibility of errors. They say any, any reader who remain worried can easily program a matrix multiplication this is the kind of uh, mathematics behind it. You can transform, you can translate a graph into a matrix multiplication, and then you can see how easy to easy make a, a program in assembler, right? <laughs> to program the machine to run the calculations because it's really zero one. It's not that complex from this point of view. Then they say it's easily replicable, our proof. Although you have two computers only in the Illinois University, University of Illinois by that time, and they verified it in other computer in another university, they say it's easily replicable, the proof, right? Again, just to say that it's logically very simple, the complexity is only combinatorial. So they make this distinction between kinds of complexity, logical complexity 
or conceptual and combinatorial nature. So this from the point of view of uh, uh, mathematics. The, the reaction. And then uh, within philosophy, really just a, a sketch, uh, the philosophical discussion started two years later. Uh, the publication is 1977, then 1979. You, we have this paper from Thomas Chimosko about the philosophical consequences of the proof. And then the main thing of this paper is to say that the, the four color theorem is the first mathematical proof a priori oh necess necessary and a a posteriori empirical necess necessity right because we use computer so in my previous works i called the argument the argument for the introduction of experimentation in mathematics that i will not go into here just what i want to what i want to say is that the his intentions were with the argument to say this, many common held beliefs about mathematics now needs to be revised. For example, that all mathematical uh, theorems are known a priori, that mathematics is different from uh, natural science because now they are using experiment and not only proofs and stuff like that. So it is very, <clears throat> it is in a certain sense, uh, philosophical revisionist, right? Now we need to revision our notion of proof and because of we need to re make this revision of in our notion of proof, we need to rethink about our concept of mathematics, right? And then we had a lot of responses to this, uh, this argument and the consequences. You have all these classical distinctions there operating, right? And uh, this is the, the same, uh, the same uh, panorama that I've shown you before, because pro this is a, a la Provitz, because Provitz in his paper of 2008 about its proof verifying programs and programs producing proofs, he makes this, um, this uh, panora panorama about the discussion. And he is like, his position, Provitz's position is that since the programs were not formally verified, the grounds we have to believe in the result are empirical and that's it, partially empirical, right? The province is like in the middle of uh, in Moscow, which is the, the, wrote the seminal paper saying that the proof was a hybrid between an experiment and Schenker saying that it was an experiment. Provitz is sort of in the middle of it because he said that the grounds we have are partially empirical to believe the theory. The theorem right and then okay what is interesting and this is the reason why i was talking about the philosophical discussion the traditional philosophical discussion is that nowadays when we look for example uh, we look at the publications from people from um, the philosophy of mathematical practice right First, every time you talk about computers in mathematics this result is mentioned and then chimosko is mentioned too of course, because he was responsible for all the discussion, right? Now, a few years ago, I made, I, I wrote a paper in, in Portuguese telling another story of this discussion, which is this. Bjork Kreisel in 77 wrote a paper about his program of unwinding proofs, in which he says, he, he mentioned the four-color theorem proof, and he said, oh, but that's okay. You know, since computers were used to discover the proof, of course they are, they need to be used to justify the proof. And that's it, no big deal. You know, since, since you know what's going on, given that someone knows how the computer operates from the symbolic point of view, it doesn't matter. <laughs> In a more, much more detailed version, how Wang says the same, also in 77, when he was giving some le uh, lectures in uh, Beijing, but then he wrote, it's in his book, Lectures in the Philosophy of, uh, Philosoph Mathematical Philosophy. So it's interesting to see that when someone knows what's going on from the computational point of view, there's no big, big deal about it. But that, this is just a parenthesis to say that until now, uh, still nowadays, every time in this, here is from people from uh, the philosophy of computer science. When they talk about the four-color theorem proof, 
it's always responding to Chimosco's argument. It's the same frame, the traditional dichotomies, the fact that computers can have hidden errors and stuff. Of course, not Mancoso is just quoted here because he mentions the per color theorem group, not because he responds to it. But what, what it strikes me is that people from philosophy of computer science are still, you know, uh, responding to this, uh, this argument. For them, it is important, this question of demarcation problems, because there is this big question about what is the nature of computer science. It is a mathematical discipline. It is an engineering discipline. It is, right? But the problem is that when we respond to the Moscow, still, we are still not, uh, we are, especially regarding the fragility, which I see there, which is the methodological one. His methodological approach to the problem is what I call a third person approach. He describes the proof in such a way that it looks like he doesn't know what he's talking about, you know? It's just that he, it's a description of the proof that shows that he doesn't understand pretty well what's going on there. And I think that a good philosophy of mathematical approach of things should go more into the details and to be written and done in a perspective, in the first person perspective. Let's try to understand the problems in the way that the mathematicians were doing this. This is why I like philosophy of mathematical practice, because the idea is not to describe things and then in the end to say, now, now, now let's change the concept of proof. What we philosophers are saying to mathematicians that they need to change their concept of proof, but we barely understand what they're doing. So, okay, many problems. And then this is, okay. So now I have, great, uh, parentheses here. Now I've been working on this for many years. And I have the opportunity to come to Paris and to spend a year studying and doing something new. And I have something new in mind, which is this. Let's put aside all this traditional dichotomies and this discussion and blah, 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 the demarcation question. Mathematics is one thing and empirical science is completely other one. Okay, let's stop it. Let's pay attention to another thing, a fact, two facts. There is two different versions of proof. One was almost completely formalized from Robertson and his team that was published in 97, using um, the general strategy, of course, it's still the same, okay? But instead of um, 1498 configurations in that avoidable set, now they, because they use a different, uh, computational machinery. They have 633 cases. So they, the, the proof is smaller now because of the computational machinery is more advanced and different. And then you have the completely formalized proof of the theorem by Gontier. In, was, uh, the report was published in 2005, but the most famous uh, text is a text that was published in the uh, notices from the American Mathematical Society in 2008. And then you have this completely formalized proof that, again, you, uses different physical devices, of course. <laughs> I mean, the devices were used in 77 were prehistoric, if you want to say like this. The different programming languages. In fact, uh, Gontier uses this um, COC, which is a formal verification. It's a system for, for formalizing mathematics, right? In, and then you have different sub-strategies, methods of verification, and in the case of Gontier, you have also a new concept. You have different concepts being engendered because of the computational machinery is different. And of course, I'm using here computational machinery, understanding all of these elements and more, right? So what I thought was, we're talking about the versions of the same proof, and there is a lot of ways to talk about the identity of proofs, especially from within proof theory, right? But there is something interesting that no one ever thought about, so which is the use of diagrams in the first proof, in the second version, and in the third one, which is completely formalized. And nevertheless, in order to present the completely formalized version of the proof, diagrams always appeared. So it's, 
people always talk about the fact that computers are not elim eliminable. We cannot eliminate computers from the solution of the four color theory proof. But what I thought is that, well, maybe you cannot eliminate diagrams too, right? And then my question is not, my question is not as much to ask if these versions are versions of the same proof, but in which aspects are they the same, right? We can say that they are the same proof because they prove the same theorem, of course. <laughs> and then you can, maybe we can translate one system into another, the logic underlying one programming into another one, and then we can prove, oh, of course, it is the same, like ontologically speaking, if you want, right? But what is interesting for me as a philosopher of mathematical practice is how are they the same? What are the differences and not things that are uh, the same? So as I was telling you, Gontier's version uses COC, which is a formal proof management system based on the calculus of inductive, inductive constructions, whose specificities played, and this is a quote, all an important part in the, success, in the success of the project. One thing which is very interesting about the project of formalizing the four color theorem proof is that Gontier and his team on yeah, they were not looking for it. They started to formalize the proof because they were trying to prove something about Cock, right? They were trying to measure Cock's power to do something, other thing. And then it's okay, let's let's make this exercise here. And then, oh, this is interesting. And then in the end, ah, they formalized the proof completely, right? Uh, and and it's interesting too that he says maybe. The most interesting thing is not that we formalized the proof, but how we did it. Because they formalized the proof, considering that the proof was a program. They looked, the procedures were to treat the proof as the proof was a program. So you can imagine all the interesting things that can be think, uh, reflected upon uh, because of the correspondence between proofs and programs and so on. So another aspect, which is different if we compare the first and the third proof is, you remember that I said that you have the topological version, then through graph theory, you go to combinatorics, right? Because you can translate uh, maps into graphs and you can deal with the combination, combinatorial pro combinatorial problems in a very, com um, you can, uh, because the, the methods are, uh, algorithmic, so potentially algorithm that it can be implemented in computers, right? Because of the ways Conchi and his team formalized it, there's no passage through graph theory, you go directly from topology to algebra, so to speak, right? So the method is really, really interesting because you, the economy that you make in terms of the mathematics, uh, there it's, um, it's different. Also, uh, yeah, there's a lot of details here, but what for me is most interesting is that you have another concept. You have a new concept, the concept of a combinatorial hypermap. So you have this beauty here, which is, uh, uh, you know, this diagram that never appeared before because now you have a new mathematical object in a certain sense that you didn't have before. Of course, maybe one, maybe one can say, well, but this is this, this is just a version of, I don't know, maybe this con condenses a lot of other, maybe we, we should go there and see this, if, if there is a possibility of talking about the translation of one, if, if it's really a new mathematical concept, or if it's just another configuration of things that were just quantitative, uh, uh, more, more complex from the quantitative point of view in the other one. But then again, always dark diagrams are everywhere. And, um, I, yeah, I like this because it's this is Gautier saying that uh, now you don't have in the completely formalized proof, you don't have the, uh, you have the very precise logical statement that Koch offers you, but then you lost the picture rich, picture rich proof outline, which also is not that uh, reliable, right? Okay, how can I deal with this problem now? So this is just the right, the general thing. How are they the same? My, I could approach this problem from the uh, like the, the locus classicus, which is uh, proof theory, right? 
And then in this sense, uh, Thiago Castro Alves from Brazil that um, uh, made his PhD in, um, in Germany recently published his uh, thesis on the identity and synonymity of proofs, which is a very interesting approach. I could, and out of course, when we approach things from the proof theoretical point of view, we can uh, see similarities here between what goes on when we normal in the process of normalization of proofs and you have the combinatorial explosion, right? Or we can think about, for example, the, um, oops, it's, in, it's not in the right order. Uh, the, of course, the discussion about proofs as programs and programs as proofs and criteria for measuring computational complexity, all of these elements can help me to, uh, to discuss how are they the same, the versions of the proof. Also from the point of view of philosophy of computer science, there's this beautiful paper from Andrews and Primiero, Giuseppe Primiero, about identity and copy of computational artifacts, right? And from the point of view of the history of uh, computation and philosophy of computation in France, these two, uh, wonderful researchers too, Lisbeth de Mol and uh, Baptiste Mellet. They have these uh, approaches to the philosophy of computer science or to philosophical and historical approaches, which I think can be very interesting. And also from the point of view of philosophy of mathematical practice, recently, David Vazak uh, also wrote a PhD dissertation in which he analyzes this uh, distinction, famous distinction between informational equivalence and computational differences, right? So I have all these facts to follow or a combination of them, but I don't want any of them. I, what I want to do now, and this is the, the turning point in my research here, is that I think that the most interest for me, the most interesting way to tackle the problem is to go back there to the first proof and to make a reconstruction of the proof from the point of view of the practitioners, from the point of view of the actors, not only Apple and Haken and Koch, the guy who developed the algorithms. Now I am reading the dissertation. So I am learning about programming languages and then I need to learn graph theory. I need to, of course, I will never be a mathematician, but you know, my idea is that I need to know enough as to put myself in the position of the people doing that, discovering that, so I can see what's going on. Considering these two dimensions, the computational dimension and the diagrammatical dimension, because it's not possible that we are still mentioning this proof and analyzing this proof, regardless of the absurd amount of diagrams that there is in it. So I've learned with Karin Shemla, the wonderful historian of mathematics. I've learned a lot of with, with her during my stay here, and I'm still learning, and I hope I can continue learning in the future, that uh, the history of mathematical practice is a, is a good way to approach this kind of problem. And then regarding my problem, what I need to do, my tasks, this is why it's T1, T2, T3 are, is, are to give a thorough account of the computational elements of the proof, both in the symbolic, but also in the material aspects, because when we start to consider the fraction, the practice, we need to consider not only the, the symbolic part of things, but also what the, the environment, right? The uh, material environment, the material conditions for the production of a mathematical result. Then the variety, investigating the variety of roles that diagrams have in the, in the text and the notations, as I, as I told you before, it was a special notation developed for this uh, thing here. So what I am doing now is just if we, re if we go again to that quote is that I'm not only paying attention, I don't want only pay attention to the computational part, but to the diagrammatical part. So you can see, they say the amount of diagrams that you have there, 85 pages with, look, it's just, it's really amazing that after so many discussions, no one ever paid attention to the use of diagrams in this proof, right? And then just to give you a hint, I don't know, Damien, how much time I've already talked. Um, I mean, 
you can have a few minutes more if you want, uh, oh, but yes. otherwise you can go to the question yeah. later. Yeah. Now, because now the idea is just to show you what I've started to do here, and then I can show you the amount of work that I have only regarding the first proof, right? Because I want to compare especially the first and the third version, but then if I want to make this from the point of view of the history of mathematical practice, I go back there to 77, I have a lot of work to do. So, for example, from the point of view of the computational machinery, do you remember where it was used, especially into the proof of a lemma from reducibility? Okay, so let's talk about the empirical devices that they were using. You can imagine the computers by the time, and then I said, you have the, the physical stuff, you have the languages, right? So this is why I'm now reading Cox dissertation to understand the algorithms. This is the kind of programming that were made. And then you have the uh, you have the uh, punching card machine, right? <laughs> because this is really prehistorical. You use punching cards. And then regarding the methods of verification, right? Uh, we already know that the, the programs were not formally verified. The checks were made handmade by the family of the authors. So all these beautiful diagrams that you see here were made by Dorothea Hecken, which now is a computer scientist in the University of uh, Toronto, if, I, if I'm not, uh, right? So the, especially the daughters, they talk about the, the sons, but one son once gave a talk saying, no, we didn't. It was just the girls working on the <laughs> handmade verification. And from the point of view of peer reading, this is interesting because it, was, it wasn't blind at all. They say, we wanted to have the paper reviewed by the best possible experts. So they uh, invited Jean Maier to go to the United States to spend a sabbatical time there. So the person who made the review was one specialist chosen by them. It's very interesting, again, from the sociological and historical point of view, right? Um, Okay, so just from the, still a lot of work to do there. And then from the diagrammatic point of view, in the first section of the first paper of the proof, I'm talking about really like um, 20 pages of 600, diagrams are used for or to specify the degree of vertices of graphs, this um, P1, this notation was developed by hash years before the proof to define the procedures for uh, proving reducibility, to establish, and then you can see the little arrows, right? Because the arrows indicate that the charge is running through the, uh, the graph. To establish exceptions to these definitions, to abbreviate configurations, to explain abbreviations, to define, I love this expression, to define by individual drawing, to define by individual drawings, some configurations, and then you have eight pages, no, nine pages for table one, two pages for table two, and blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, in the end, to list, to show the reducible configurations, because you cannot say, okay, and then the computer, the computer produced this and that's it. No, you need to show the configurations that were produced. So the computer, can you imagine, made the output in, and then they were drawing, drawing, drawing. So again, a lot of work to do regarding the computer part, regarding the diagrammatic part, and then how do they interact, right? Because again, if I want, to understand this thing, I need to understand what's going on. So the methodological guides, guides again, um, I love this paper from Karim from the end of the 80s where she, the title of the paper is, should they read Fortran as it was English? <laughs> Which is, uh, of course, Karim, as you know, she's a specialist in Asian Chinese geometry, right? And, um, but, but I think there is, we have been talking about it, there is a lot of things in common between 
the ancient tradition of geometry, Chinese geometry, and what's going on here, just exactly because of the interaction between algorithms, sets of instructions, and the use of diagrams and how they interact. So this is a, from the historical point of view, it's very interesting to see this, this connection, right? So just uh, some methodological uh, uh, guidelines for what I am going to do now. And uh, it's really, it's a lot of work. I'm in love with it. I hope I had like more three years in Paris so I could do it, but I don't have. So yeah, and, and, and everything just uh, regarding all the, the work. And then you can imagine, maybe two, three, four years to finish with the first proof. And then now let's go to the, the last one, Gontier proof, completely formalized. Then I need to learn calculus of induction, inductive construction. And okay, maybe the rest of my life I will be doing this. So I'm finishing. The last thing is just, to, this, uh, I like to, I like to end, to close the presentation with this letter that the Morgan wrote one quote from the letter, first letter, I guess, that he wrote to Hamilton to talk about the problem. And then he says, I'm trying, you know, it's, it looks simple, but it, I don't know, maybe it's a tricky work. So the more I think of it, the more evident it seems that there is a simple solution, but I cannot see. So if you retort with some very simple case, which makes me out a stupid animal, I think I must do as the Sphinx did. So it's very dramatical here. It's, oh my God, the Sphinx when Oedipus uh, resolved the, you know, the enigma. I don't know. In some versions, he just she just runs away. In other ones, she kills herself and so on. So very dramatic stuff. You know, it's so complex the history of this problem. And people keep saying, oh, it's just a combinatorial stuff. It's not that complex. But then when you look at it again, not from the third person perspective, but when you look at it from someone who is trying to make it, then things get really, really complex. So I think we should not think as the Morgan, you know, it's not simple. That's okay. We can work together and especially philosophers of mathematics. So I think should learn together with mathematicians in order to do a better philosophy of mathematics and not as I think this case shows with the discussion that uh, have been started with Chimosko, something that, you know, I do it alone and I describe distantly. And uh, I think it's time for us to really pay attention to what, what is the practice that we are analyzing. And maybe this is something interesting too for other areas of philosophy, but I think I, I've said enough. So thank you.